Father, we thank you for the privileged time that fires to gather here to worship as your body here in the southern part of Medford. We get to worship you according to scripture and how it demands that we have read the public, done, paid attention to the public reading of scripture. We have not forsaken the assembly. We seek to have a God-centered worship service with songs that are doctrinally rich, that put you on display, that enthrone you in praise. And now we sit under your word for you to instruct us, to equip us, to lead lives to your praise and glory as we just sang. So God, we pray that you would do a marvelous work through the Spirit. We would pray for those that can't be with us today. Lord, we, uh, we think of Sanford that you would uh, give the doctor's wisdom, help his uh, ankle to heal up quickly. Thank you even for the modern convenience of medical care that we can avail ourselves of. We pray for those going through colds and flu bugs that they would, uh, uh, their bodies would be made well soon. Thank you for those that are back from vacation, that you would uh, just uh, use us during this busy season. We're getting ready for the holidays. Many of us get ready for uh, moves, uh, selling homes, buying homes, and all the hubbub of life. Help us to be still and know that you're God, to prioritize our lives around kingdom business with uh, a heavenly agenda about what we do God, we, we thank you for this privilege. Pray that you're sure it would tutor us in your truth for what it looks like in obedience and faith. We pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Oh, let's go back to prayer. <coughs> Father, we do continue to pray for the upcoming elections that you would just help us to do our part knowing that regardless of what happens in the polls that you're on your throne. So Lord, help us to uh, vote biblical convictions and the elections coming up and, uh, and for all the lawsuit going on with Grace Church I think uh, next month there's another hearing and whatnot that uh, you would find in favor of your church and if not that we would know what that looks like in lies of obedient praise we pray in your name Amen. Amen. you can tell that uh, my brain's a little scrambled this morning I've had a headache for a couple of days it's probably going towards a migraine but let's uh, enjoy our time now before uh, later on this afternoon when that all takes effect and we can enjoy our study of scripture. You might have noticed that in your in your bulletin this morning there was is an insert. Please don't read it during the, uh, the preaching. It's for coffee time this afternoon uh, to orient your mind. It's just a reminder that uh, next Saturday is really when we celebrate 503 years of what came out in the Great Reformation, the, uh, the truths that were fought for doctrinally are summarized in five solars, that, that salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, and it's revealed in Scripture alone, which is our text this morning, our, our theme in the text this morning, we want to look at a sermon that I have entitled, A Life Centered Around the Word, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. So if you haven't found your way there, let me invite you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, that one sola, without scripture alone, the other solas are lost and in danger, or, or in danger of being lost. The reformers experienced this danger firsthand. Rome had elevated tradition so high that it became a second infallible source of divine revelation. Teachings contrary to scripture crept into the church and the voice of scripture was muffled. The reformers believed that the scriptures were the swaddling clothes of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the gospel was to be retrieved, and with it the other solas, then scripture had to be elevated once again to the position of final supreme authority. Sola scriptura meant that only scripture as God's inspired word is the church's inerrant, sufficient, and final authority. 
With biblical authority back in the pulpit, the believer would hear the message of Scripture itself, and in that message, the gospel of God's free grace was born again. Look at the architecture of the early churches. When the, our Puritan forefathers came across, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving the end of next month, right? And they wanted uh, simple church houses that, that uh, focus on the sacred desk, the pulpit, because this is why we gather. We want to know and do God's truth. So we turn to a passage that speaks most concisely of the work of the Word in both salvation and sanctification. And it presents a high view of Scripture as we understand its inspiration, its inerrancy, its authority, and its sufficiency. Not last week, but the week before, we looked at the primary task of the pastor. Right? It is... Uh, what comes in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we are to preach the word, regardless of whether it's a cool time to do so or not. We speak up for God. This is what he has indeed said about the issues of life. What gives the basis for that? The text that we're going to look at this morning. We must regain a high view of the scriptures in the church house. When we got ready for gospel outreach from the, the tragedy of the fires that swept through and we were reaching out, one of the contacts as I was at to one of the staging, you know, the staging site for a couple of days and one of the Gideons that I knew came through the line is like, bro, we need Bibles. Get us some Bibles because we want to get the word out there. And so one of his fellow Gideons uh, came to came to, to give me a, a whole stack full. We've still got a bunch. If you've got people you're sharing the gospel with, Plenty of Bibles to put in their hands. Well, years ago, I got one of my first, uh, I think it was a green, either a green or an orange Gideon New Testament. In the very front, I, I cut, yes, I, I dissected the page out of there. Here's their conviction. Why did they, at their own expense, buy Bibles and travel all over the world? Because they believe that the power for life change is in the Word of God. And so here's what the, this little Gideon New Testament uh, page said that I clipped out so many years ago. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, the design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It's a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It's given you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, and will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. That such conviction is what drives them to get the word of God out there. The word which God promised himself will not return to him void of accomplish the purpose that he sent it forth. Amen. Luther was asked to explain the mounting success of the Reformation. He responded with unwavering confidence in God's word. He said, I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word did everything. The Protestant movement was founded on scripture alone and therefore could not be stopped. You might wonder, all right, pastor, we've got it. Can we just move on? I think if the church got it, 
that there would be a lot different kind of ministry that was taking place in our day. I, was, uh, I don't intentionally tune into Christian radio a whole lot, and I, was, I heard it the other day, and uh, some of the banter that was going on as they were, yeah, I, I love good, solid Christian music, don't get me wrong in, in this statement, but they were, they were treating music like it was actually the living and active word of God. It's not. Only God, God's word is powerful and accomplishes his purpose. Uh, why, why have I invested my life in Bible exposition, biblical counseling, even counseling? It's not therapy. You know, people will come to, come to the office and it's like, okay, I've tried everything there is here in the valley. What do you got to offer? What's different about what you're doing? It's like it's, I, I just take out my Bible. It's, it's discipling and biblical principles because my opinions don't accomplish a whole lot. And they don't carry a whole lot of weight. Amen to that? So we dig into the Word. We need to develop a similar conviction that it's only God's Word that's living and active, Hebrews 4.12. It is not the fallen logic of sinful man that so many rely upon, whether it be psychology or human philosophy or pragmatic church growth gurus or a host of other substitutions for the Word of God. Why are we pulling out the butter knife of man's wisdom instead of taking out the scalpel of the Word that does the heart surgery that we need done? We must depend not occasionally, but daily, for it to nourish our souls and to equip us to bring Him glory. To quench all the, the fiery darts of the wicked one that come head on in our lives. And to strengthen us to walk uprightly overcoming the struggles and the tragedy of life in a fallen world. You ever noticed uh, I, many times in my devotions I'm, uh, spent, I'm in at least one psalm. And recently I, I saw the psalmist just begging God for deliverance and protection and find, here's, here's the model for us. We do just what he did. We go to the Lord in prayer and open our Bibles for him to speak to us. It's a communication. So we, I asked you to open to 2 Timothy chapter 3. When I was in seminary, the then president of the board of the seminary that I went to, every graduation of uh, seminary students going out. He would read this chapter to remind men that are going out in full-time ministry. Now, we, we understand I do everything backwards. I've been in the ministry for a dozen years before I realized I had to go back to school for, for better training in this book. But that aside, this chapter is more up-to-date than tomorrow's newspaper that hasn't been written yet. As Paul writes to Timothy, and he says to him in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, realize this. In the last days, difficult times will come. And I would say to you, dear friend, they're here. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding a form of godliness, although they've denied its power. Paul says to Timothy, avoid men such as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins. Led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of de depraved mind rejected in regard to the faith. You now, those are pretty strong words in verse 8. Such are ministers of uh, so called ministers of the gospel. Depraved. Verse 9. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all. Just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Iconium, or, or at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul, Paul's telling Timothy, his young protege in the ministry, it's not going to get any better. You just keep on doing what I've been doing. Verse 14. So, so they're going to keep progressing in the evilness and the perversion of their own lives. You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. And that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So put your seatbelts on. Don't get worried. I know there's 17 verses and you say there's no way our pastor can get through 17 verses. We're just looking at verses 14 to 17. We read the whole chapter to establish the context. <clears throat> Perilous times. Literally savage times. This word is used two times in the New Testament. The other place that it's used besides here is in Matthew 8, 28 where you've got Two demon-possessed men at Gadara who, quote, are extremely violent. Paul's telling Timothy, you're, you're going to be living in the violent days. And there's one solution. And he gets into the Word of God. Let me propose to you that every saint of God to endure perilous times or savage times we must center our lives around the Word of God, the Bible. It's all about scriptures. There is no let up, no survival mode of just getting by or some occasional time, but tying our lives in to His eternal and authoritative truth. Let me orient our thinking for just a moment as we, as we dig in here to, to 2 Timothy 3. The pastoral epistles... That is 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Our books given us vital instruction on what is the church and how does it operate. I think a lot of ministries ought to check in with what Paul teaches Timothy about faithful ministry. What is the church? How does it operate? That's the pastoral epistles in general. The core of 2 Timothy is all about the Word. Chapter 1, it's stir up. Chapter 2, it's stand up. Chapter 3, it's stay up. And chapter 4, it's speak up. In chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, Paul says to this young ministry associate, stir up the gift that's within you. Don't be fearful. And he follows up in chapter 2 with stand up. Be a strong disciple and make strong disciples. It's all about multiplying yourself, Timothy. Invest in faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Stir up the gift. Stand up by being a strong disciple and making strong disciples. Number, chapter 3, stay up during difficult times. Even though they go from bad to worse. Use the word to be an unashamed man of God. And then when he transitions into chapter 4, speak up. We speak where God speaks. We keep our mouth shut where God's mouth is shut. We have nothing else of eternal consequence to deliver to people than what God has already said. It's not a matter of personal opinion, but the life-giving, heart-transforming, inspired, inerrant, authoritative, and sufficient word. Now, those doctrines of the Bible's inspiration, inerrancy, and authority, and sufficiency, they're all in this text, in just a few short verses. Notice, first of all, the teaching of the Word in verse 14. He's looking Timothy eyeball to eyeball, and he takes out the bony finger of you. You don't engage in these perilous pursuits that others in the world are doing, but continue so it's not something new and to be reinvented. Continue how faithful ministry has been going on. Continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. 
Now, Paul was Timothy's spiritual father, his father in the faith. But Paul was not the only one. You know, even though apostates deliberately reject revealed truth, Timothy, don't back down. You, however, there's a strong contrast that even today marks off a very small number of ministries. You stay at it. It's not a matter of reinventing ministry. It's about being a dinosaur, doing the same old ministry that's been done by faithful people who have already laid a faithful track record for you to follow. It's a well-beaten track. Be careful. And reproduce yourself. And the New King James translates this, carefully followed rather than continue. Do you get it? That faithful ministry is not a matter, matter of reinventing, but it's a matter of connecting. Don't invent, but continue. Just tie into faithful men of the past as we rely on apostolic commands and apostolic examples that have already been recorded for us to pattern our lives and ministries after. Study scripture. Study church history. And see what faithful, God-exalting men have done and so do. Timothy, don't be wild and dazzled by the new things coming down the pipe as if they're going to work better than what's been being done. Build your life around it. Live in it. Let it live in you as you memorize the book and you meditate on the book and you study the book and you put it into action. Paul does talk about the importance of doctrine. The doctrine is for duty. It comes from God. This is what is right. We're going to deal with that in a, uh, a little bit later on in the text. But doctrine is doxological. The deeper we go in the text of Scripture, we respond in greater heights of worship as God continues to unpack His greatness and what He expects of you and I. <laughs> As we know him who's revealed, then we can ascribe him glory and worth for his greatness in creation and in salvation and in sanctification. We put him on display in our worship corporately and daily as we adorn the gospel and are transformed from one level of glory to another. You know, in John 8, verse 31, Jesus said, If you continue my words, you are my disciples. Those who are truly His will obey Him and be transformed by Him. It's not enough to believe what Jesus says. We must accept it and depend on it. Said differently, uh, since I said that doctrine is doxological, doctrine is for doing, uh, how about we understand theology as a verb, not a noun? Truth is transforming. It's to be obeyed and applied. James says it in James 1.22. Do not delude yourselves in thinking you can know the word and not do the word. This is a present active imperative. It is a command. It demands... Con it, this is a continual, constant habit of life. You know what I found out in all these years of ministry is that uh, um, those that we think are the word are not in the Word as much as we think they're in the Word. We slump towards holiness, and we're, we, we lack great consistency many times in the daily disciplines. How about our devotional life, our devotional habits? Are we in the Word occasionally or daily? If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments. How are we going to keep what we don't know? For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. You know, this is not some legalist who, well, i got to get in my, my Bible reading today so I can kind of check it off. No, this is, this is fellowship with the triune God, God speaking to you. 
Like, how often have, have I been in a slumber in my recliner? I'm trying to get the caffeine in me as quick as I can to wake up because these are life-altering truths that we are looking upon. So as believers submitted to his lordship, we read scripture not to know and believe solely, but to do as well. Life and ministry is consumed and dictated by this word. 2 John verse 9, those who don't abide in the doctrine of Christ don't have God. He who abides makes his home there as the Father and the Son. You know, so we're talking about abiding there. Timothy just continued in these same truths, and we're going to get somewhere in the next verse, but just hold with me for a minute on this thought. This abiding and obedience are inseparable. It's clear fruit of regeneration that we, we long to know God and to obey Him. The first Step of obedience is follow the Lord and believe his baptism, right? And uh, the first thing we want to do is, okay, Lord, you've done everything. You've gone all the way to the cross. You tell me, jump, I say, okay, Lord, how high? So not only does he address teaching of the word, continue in what you know, but be sure of what you know. Look at verse 15. How about the power of the word, verse 15? That from childhood, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Childhood. It's easier understood as babyhood. Paul wasn't, you know, his father in the faith was not the only one. It wasn't just when Paul the Apostle started schooling him later on in life. He had a godly grandmother, Grandma Lois and Mama Eunice, who first demonstrated genuine godliness. Only one believing parent and a godly grandma who took responsibility serious to preach and live the gospel. Our only holdout is God's truth, dear parent. We cannot save a soul. We cannot sanctify our, a soul. And if we have raised our children in the nurture and evidence of the Lord, the rest is up to the Spirit of God through His Word. You, you've done what you can do to teach. You've been honest with your own sin accounts and your failings. Did you read Scripture to your unborn? Or did you? You know, when I talk with parents these days about family religion or family devotions, that's almost a, a foreign language, no concept. Uh, I don't, do not have a, a file in my mind for how we think about this. Yeah, we are talking about family devotions as well. In, uh, in Luke 1, this term childhood is used of an unborn child. When John the Baptist leapt in the womb, we have no idea at what age youngsters start comprehending concepts long before they can communicate it to them. Are we in it for the long haul? And we're going to be diligent in discipling our kids from the womb to the tomb, if that's what it takes. Jewish parents' duty was to teach their children the law when in the fifth year. Deuteronomy 6 we are to be training our kids when we rise up and when we sit down. And the, the Hebrewism is ever in between as well. It's understood to be a fact of life. So, so yes, there's going to be some formal family devotions. But are we turning all of life situations into a devotional lesson as well? Like when we uh, pop a cork and need to confess it as sin and, uh, and go and ask for forgive, forgiveness. You know, I guess the question would be, are you catechizing your kids? Uh, and grandparent, lest you think that, okay, I raised my kids, are you catechizing your grandkids? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. And as you're learning to meditate on Scripture, teaching others that this is a valuable time spent in the book. You see, kids are one of, one of the greatest mission fields 
that God has given us. So let's raise up straight arrows and shoot them straight. Timothy, from babyhood, you're one who's known the sacred writings. Perhaps your translation renders this holy scriptures. What's being referred to here, literally it's referring to the Old Testament. The New Testament had not been finished yet. All Timothy had had was the Old Testament writings. And yes, Jesus is being pointed to all through as the, uh, the Old Testament as the fulfillment of the law. Ancient Greek philosopher and mathematician, astronomer and statesman, Archytas in 4 BC says, quote, the law, if it is alive, is indeed king. If, however, it is lifeless, it is nothing but a letter. Contrary to that, this is a lie. This is the only book on our bookshelf that when we read, it reads us. It's alive and accomplishes God's purpose. What's your view of this book that was bled out? We sang uh, ancient words in our song service today. Those who have bled over and preserved, and yet we read it so little. Do we love it? As my daughter was driving us in this morning, I got to play on my phone and keep my eyes closed, try to keep the, the migraine at bay, and I introduced her to my word of the day. This wasn't the word of the day that came in my email. Let me give you a word. Bibliophile. A bibliophile. That's what we call a lover of books. Some of us gladly confess that we are book lovers with a book reading addiction. I posted on Facebook a week or two ago uh, this caption of a person smelling their brand new book, paper book, not, not e-book, paper book. And, you know, I, I understand you think that's odd, but that's okay. Being a bibliophile is, is not a good thing, though, if that's all you love. Augustine, the early church theologian, tells us in his confessions that he, would, he was a book lover. Yet he admits that he did not profit, they did not profit him in the least. He said, what good did it do me that I, at a time when I was the vile slave of evil desires, read and understood for myself every book that I could lay my hands on? I enjoyed these books and did not know the source of whatever in them was true and certain. For I had my back to the light and my face to the things on which the light shone. So the eyes in my face saw things in the light, but on my face itself no light fell, unquote. It wasn't until Augustine opened his mind to the message of God's book, the Bible, did the light of saving truth flood his soul. Books flow from our presses in a flood of print, fast and furious. They can be entertaining, informative, and oh so valuable. But if we read them with our, our back to the light, as Augustine did for so long, our back to the light of God's book will remain ignorant of the truth. So don't just be a book lover. Love God's book. Amen? That needs to be our priority in life. Lovers of the book. Why are people giving time and priority and importance to everything but the main thing? Studying the Word, doing the Word, preaching the Word, counseling in the Word. You know, I was sharing with a brother in the last week or two. We're all counselors. We're either good biblical counselors or we're bad counselors. Can't have them both. So friend, is your conviction that it's as important, reading my Bible and studying, knowing what God has said on the matter as the very health of my soul. That it's, you're as desperate to hear from word as you are for the next breath that you take or the next meal that you need when you get some rumbling in the tumble. Timothy, remember what you have known all your life from the womb. That which is able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. How powerful is this book? The, the, not only that we read, but what, 
what reads us and accomplishes a purpose. It's able to teach. It's able to instruct. You know, I think that underscores that there is an academic nature to the Christian faith. We cannot obey that which we do not know and understand. So yes, there is an academic nature, but so that every study is not just academic, it, it is doxological, it's a worshipful experience, it's a devotional exercise. You know, there are certain truths we must know. It's not just any God that saves. No matter what the person you're evangelizing says, doesn't every religion lead you there? Lead you there? No. It's the Jesus of the Gospels. Read the Gospel of John. You know, this book can open blind eyes. The natural man, 1 Corinthians 2.14, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God as foolishness. Give him the Word. Only the Word can save a soul. You take the truth plus faith and the Spirit's convicting work, you've got salvation. In Timothy's context, he didn't have 66 books in his Bible. You can even take the Old Testament and lead somebody to salvation. Especially a Jew. You know, this is what Timothy grew up on. Because without biblical revelation, there is no message concerning Christ, whereby the Spirit can convict sinners and draw them to himself. We must give people the word of God after we've been in the word. You know, as you think about um, just the Old Testament that Timothy had, Genesis to Malachi. Well, that's enough to reveal holiness and the majesty and the love of God. That's enough to teach us the depth of man's depravity. It's the very first book of the Bible in Genesis 6, 5 that tells us that the, the intents of man's heart was only evil continually. That's pretty reprobate. Or Jeremiah 17, where, where the prophet says that the heart is deceitful of all things desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Old Testament was sufficient to teach of God's forgiveness and redemption. What is man's greatest need? He needs forgiveness of his sins. And there's only one God that will do that. <clears throat> Timothy, get into that book that reveals Jesus book to book. Say, wait, Old Testament, yeah. Jesus on the Emmaus Road is schooling his disciples that all the Old Testament is pointing forward to his coming. The Word bears witness of him. They search the scriptures for in them they think they have eternal life. You cannot reason somebody into the Christian faith. Give them the Word of God, not your opinion. From childhood, Timothy knew the Old Testament writings, which are powerful enough to give new life to a dead soul. And giving good doctrine for healthy living as a believer. There's great power in the book. There's the, the ability to change a life. You know, the French philosopher Voltaire sat one day to rewrite Psalm 51 in poetic form. All went well until he came to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Voltaire, though the chief opponent of Christianity in his day, attempted to translate the verse into his poem. And as he wrote, a sudden realization of the terror of hell came upon him. He tried to shape the feeling, but found himself unable to write. Later he confided to his friends that he could not think of that experience without an inner fear that haunted him. What does that? It's a powerful word. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. You establish accountability right out of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. You're you sharing the gospel with people. You, you share them the truth. It's foolish for them to say there's no God. This is the message from God called the Revelation. No need to defend it. The old Baptist preacher, C.H. Spurgeon, said the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. All you got to do is let the lion loose and the lion will defend itself. So the people you're sharing Christ with, they're saying, oh yeah, the scriptures.
script. The Bible, that's all riddled through with an inconsistency and holes. Just give them the word of God and it will defend itself. No need for the likes of you and I. No other book can strip us bare in revealing our sin and build us up in Christ in our righteousness. That's the power therein. Timothy, remember the word which saved your sin-sick soul and is sanctifying you. That is what you teach to others. A few more words about this book. How about in verse 16? The authority and usefulness of the word. We actually see inerrancy and authority and sufficiency as we see where this book comes from. And how it's totally useful, more useful than anything else in life. Notice, first of all, he says that all Scripture is inspired by God. It's breathed out. God breathed, literally God blown. The out-breathing of God, outspired. The Spirit of God came and rested on and in the prophets to speak through them so that their words did not come from themselves. But from the mouth of God, they spoke and wrote in the Holy Spirit. You see, when we talk about the doctrine of inspiration, we're not talking about guys who got a great thought and got inspired to write a good story. Inspiration does not refer to them, but the writings that they wrote. It is from God and about God. And yet God used human instrumentality. So here we are in 2 Timothy. Go back in your Bibles, just four books. Uh, next one is a bigger one, Hebrews and James and 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 20. Second Peter 1.20 Know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Insert your thinking, origin, because that's what the word is referring to. Doesn't come from the, the source of God. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That word moved in verse 21, is the same word when, when the wind would move, the, the term is pharaoh, it would move uh, uh, the sails of a boat to wherever that wind wanted them to go. Same term, the Spirit did to the writers of Scripture. He moved them along so that what they wrote was indeed the Word of God. Psalm 119, 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Yes, divinely revealed to man on earth and divinely authenticated in heaven. It's been providentially given and providentially preserved. That great Princeton president and professor of theology, B.B. Warfield, put it this way, quote, Inspiration is a supernatural influence exerted on the sacred writers by the Spirit of God, by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. Love that phrase, divine trustworthiness. And notice its spiritual twin as we talk about uh, doctrine about the scriptures. It's not just inerrant finding its source in God. If God did indeed breathe it out, it cannot be with error. It is inerrant because of where it comes from. This is the doctrine that unbelievers have challenged primarily since the Enlightenment period. The two doctrines are directly related, inspiration and inerrancy. Inspiration is the source and work of God, and since it's His, coming from His perfect character, it speaks of veracity. God can't lie. <clears throat> He's bound by his own character, Titus 1-2. There's no less at stake than truthfulness and the trustworthiness of God. His very character and nature are at stake when you try to say that it's full of error. So it's inspired. 
says Paul to Timothy. And notice after the conjunction, it's also profitable. It speaks of Scripture's usefulness, its full sufficiency. It is all encompassing and beneficial. It meets all the spiritual needs of God's people, leaving no issue of life. I don't care how complicated the issue is and how convoluted to some sort of special knowledge outside of Scripture. Jot down for tea time Psalm 19, verses 7 to 13. The psalmist gives the characteristics of the law of the Lord. He said it's perfect, it's sure, it's right, it's pure, it's clean, it's true. These are absolute terms and leave no room for partiality or substitutions. And the blessing that he promises in the word, the same chapter of Psalm 19, this, this exhaustive truth from God restores the soul, it makes wise the simple one, it rejoices the heart, it enlightens the eyes, and endures forever, and produces complete righteousness. Talk about full profit in life. It's in there. And then he goes on to specify all the areas of profitability for the believer. So, if the Bible meets the biggest need of man, if you're outside of Christ, you need to get saved. And the power of the Lord is in there to teach you who God is. And then after you get saved, what's your greatest need is to be sanctified, to grow in the image of Jesus. You get into the book for the same thing. It's fully or four functions in our lives. It's beneficial or useful in these areas. Notice, first of all, it's profitable for teaching. It is doctrine, which I mentioned earlier. Biblical revelation structures our thinking. Especially since our... How, how total is your depravity? Total. The theologians refer to sin's effect on our, on our thinking capacity. It's the noetic effects of sin. We can even think ourselves out of paper bag. We need the Bible to teach us what to think and how to think about the issues of life. Because left to ourselves, we don't think rightly. In Timothy's con context, even the Old Testament is profitable and beneficial for getting your doctrine from. In spite of preachers of our day wanting us to disconnect from the Old Testament. We'll let guilty parties like Andy Stanley and others that remain anonymous. Who want us Christians in the church to disengage from the Old Testament. You know, in Romans chapter... 15 and verse 4. Why is it that I talk about we're going to be starting a biblical counseling class pretty soon? Uh, don't we need degrees or letters after our names to make us competent to counsel? Aren't we supposed to outsource complicated cases of the soul to the professionals, whoever they are? In Romans 15 and verse 4, here is the divine revelation given by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. May the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. That's a good verse, but I, uh, that was verse 5, not 4. He says in verse 4, whatever is written in earlier times. What earlier times? Timothy knew all, all of the Old Testament. All of it's written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scripture you might have hope. Timothy was equipped for ministry in the Old Testament. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 14, concerning you, my brothers, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, no secret knowledge, all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. Who's able to admonish their fellow believer? The Christian. The one who is indwelt by the Spirit of God with their Bible laid open. That's the basic premise to J. Adams' Competent Council years ago when it was published. You, beloved Christian, 
who are indwelt by the Spirit and know God's truth can be a good counselor for the brethren. You know, practically speaking, our behavior is so lacking because of our thoughts and heart. You know, our heart, we've said before, is Mission Control Center. Everything that we do or say comes from our heart. That's going to come out very pointedly in the next chapter of Mark, in Mark 7, when we get there next week. When we're going. Every, all of our plans and our desires and, our, and all that the heart conspires. The Bible gives wisdom for fulfilling all the commands and requires for us to believe, to think, to say, to do. It's found in the inerrant, inspired, authoritative, sufficient word. That's why the wisest man to ever step foot on planet Earth, Solomon, who was endowed wisdom like nobody else, would say to us in such a, such a succinct way, trust in the Lord with some of your heart, right? Is that how the verse goes? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. When it's all curvy and screwed up, where do we go? To His Word. The sole revelation of truth that we lean into. You see, dear friend, it's futile to expect to live a spiritual life without knowing spiritual truth. So the first benefit is that Scripture instructs the believer how to live, in what to believe, and what God expects. It's related to content and doctrine. This actually fleshes out Jesus' final words to his church in the Great Commission. And what's consume our focus and time in the local church. Jesus tells the church, before the church even exists in Matthew 28, make disciples. And through the process, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. We must have the word of God, which is profitable for teaching. And notice the second thing that it does in our life here. It's profitable for reproof. To censure us. The Bible corrects us. Here Paul explains Scripture's purpose of admonishing, pointing out where we have erred and departed from what God requires. There's no way to tone it down and to preserve your self-esteem when the Spirit of God is walking all over your heart through His truth. In verbal form, He brings to light, He exposes and punishes he shows us what's out of bounds. For even refuting error, where do you go? Your opinions or the Word of God? Archbishop uh, Richard Trent says it refers to rebuking, quote, an other with such effectual wielding of the victorious arm of truth as to bring him not always to confession, yet at least to a conviction of his sin. You know, when you confront somebody's sin, they're not always going to turn around. But you have discharged their duty and the Spirit of God gets on them like they have an ape because he's using his word if they're a true believer. The word of God is good to reprove. <coughs> Paul told his other ministry protege, Titus, in Titus 2.15. He said to Titus the same thing he tells Timothy here. He said, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority and let no one disregard you. You know, so as you're honoring your, even your senior saints, Titus, don't let them look down upon you. You're a foolish young man. You don't, it can't be that simple, that easy. You see, when man shares opinions, you can debate. But you speak for, forth the word and God comes with his inherent authority. So scripture is the plumb line for our thoughts and our actions, our motives, our beliefs, due to our depravity and even our deceitful hearts, we need the word, the word that discerns and judges our heart. So that when we've deviated in doctrine or practice, when we're wearing blinders, a brother loves us enough to come with the truth and say, here's the path, walking away. We ought to appreciate the reproof of Scripture. 
and believers as much as they bring it to us. Timothy, don't forget that this book is profitable in your life for teaching, for reproof, also for correction. It doesn't just tell you what's wrong. It tells you what's right. Correction. This is the companion to reproof. It restores you. It's useful for improving. In secular Greek literature, it's used of setting upright an object which has fallen down on its face. What does that? The Word of God. Not only does it show that we're out of fellowship, but how we can be restored to fellowship with God and with the brethren. Hallelujah. That his word doesn't just diagnose the problem, but shows us how to get right. Does, doesn't leave us in the cesspool of our wickedness. This, my friends, is a grand gift from God. It identifies the corrected attitude and belief and behavior that needs to get put on. So yes, we, we are admonished by Scripture to put off sinful habits. And as we renew our minds thinking biblically, this book helps us get back on the right path, replacing those sinful habits with righteous ones. That is the biblical process of change. Helps us clean out junk closets of our hearts and how to put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. This is a positive provision for those who accept the negative reproof that he gives. Tells us what's right. Tells us what's wrong. How to get it right. And notice this fourth. How do we keep it right? It, it, good for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. In our literature, chiefly, this is attained by discipline, correction. You see, we're immature babies because we don't know this book of all books. Sanctification, growth into Christ-likeness, many times and in many ways is a knowledge issue, not just an obedience issue. Let, let's illustrate this way. So in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, we cannot obey the command to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord without a knowledge of the book that tells us to do such. Go to the training manual. It's easy to claim, train up a child in the way, and then say, why did he go, to, go astray? I did my best. But was your best according to the book? leaving you with no condemnation of conscience that you've discharged your duty to raise him in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and leave the results to God. God that can produce heart change. Furthermore, since we illustrated with parents in Ephesians 6, what about, how do we have a Christ-exalting marriage without consulting the architect who gave all the instructions necessary beginning in the first marriage he put together with Adam and Eve. When we talk about counseling one another, the Bible is the only true guide. It, it reveals creation, it reveals man, it reveals marriage, his divine architecture for marriage and life, all our counsel needs to come in this book. Bible preaching and teaching of the church is where training is provided. That's why we pray for God to continue to raise up more. We do believe in expositional preaching. We do believe in biblical counsel. Mark it down, dear sheep. The shepherds cannot guard untaught sheep. It's impossible. At the same time, this becomes the shepherd's encouragement that as they see the congregation acting and speaking and thinking biblically over the long haul, wow, the Spirit of God's at work. God's at work through his living and active words not only inform his people, but also transform his people. You can tell one's doctrine by what kind of lives they are living. A final caveat of this uh, fourth benefit, this, this training in righteousness. 
shows us how to put into practice its teaching on a daily basis. What this path of righteousness looks like. As I'm streamlining, kind of constantly editing on the fly here. As time goes away. Look at verse 17. We've seen the words uh, teaching, it's its power, its authority and usefulness. What, what does it bring about? It equips for every good work. It's capable. It's complete. It's proficient. Able to meet all demands. Now that's a pretty audacious statement for Paul to make. In fact, many self-styled church growth gurus would say, if you're gonna, if all you're going to do is teach the Bible. That's kind of naive. That's kind of a myopic focus, wouldn't you think? Much of what causes fear and apathy in serving God is a lack of knowledge of the Word. Yes, we're confident God's at work. And He will complete the work in us. But how does He do that according to His tool, the book? We, beloved, are responsible to present ourselves as diligent workers of the Word. We're studying it. We're understanding it. We're applying its truths, which assumes hermeneutics and proper Bible study technique. But it leads us to not be ashamed. I would trade that for the world. We're going to count for time that's not spent, spent in this eternal book. There's transformation in the power of the word to equip us for every good word. The word there equipped is furnished, completely outfit, outfitted. The word was used for documents that were totally in order, not like my sermon notes that got out of order this morning. All in order. Or a wagon or a rescue boat that is totally outfitted for the trip. There's nothing getting left behind. How well equipped would you be if you're taken off for a barren wilderness on a long trip? There was a television program preceding the Winter Olympics one year that featured blind skiers being trained for slalom skiing. Uh, that register? And you had bl uh, blind skiers trained for the slalom. Impossible as that sounds. Yeah, they're paired with sighted skiers. The blind skiers were taught on the flats how to make right and left hand turns. When that was mastered, they were taken to the slalom slope where their sighted partners skied beside them, shouting, left, right. And as they obeyed the commands, they were able to negotiate the course and cross the finish line, depending solely on the sighted <coughs> skier's word. It was either complete trust or utter catastrophe. What a vivid <coughs> illustration of the Christian life. In this world, we're in reality blind about what course to take. So we rely solely on the word of the only one who is truly sighted, God himself. His word gives us the direction that we need to finish this course and finish it well. It equips for every good work. Now this is the significance of being part of a healthy church with Bible exposition and biblical counseling. I ought to be clear, the only two resources God's given in life to conduct our lives, His Spirit and the Word that He inspired. That's it. That's what we need to walk in the Spirit and in the Word. We need no other revelation on how to live the Christian life. You know, I was recently meditating in Galatians 5 where we see the works of the flesh and all that legalism can bring about or that's just muscling it through in our sin issues. That's not sanctification. In contrast to the works of the flesh is the fruit that the Spirit alone produces. The one who enables the Christian life through His Word. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to reveal the will of God to the child of God to accomplish the work of God for the glory of God. 
I think the church has failed to truly understand, believe, embrace, and live out a robust conviction of the inspiration, the inerrancy, the authority, and the sufficiency of Scripture. And when I say that church, I'm not saying our church. Our church is part of that church as a whole. We must believe Scripture is enough. It doesn't need supplemented with our techniques, our programs, our experiences, our exercises, our entertainment. Scripture is God's own provision for every spiritual truth. It leads us to faith. It teaches truth to believers. It refutes error and it trains us to live righteously. Spend time in it. Obey it. Study it until you understand it. Make it part of your nature. Don't take it for granted. Don't question it. Place nothing above it. Gain as much Bible understanding as you memorize it and meditate and read it and daily intake it. Maybe we can encourage you to resolve to make obedience to the word an obsession, not just an option. This is not a buffet where we pick and choose what we want. We're not simply Bible believers, we're Bible practicers. Only one main response Paul gives in his last chapter of 2 Timothy, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Weeks ago. Preach it. During the Reformation, they put the pulpit in the center due to their conviction on Sola Scriptura. And the church today is working hard to move it aside and replace it with a thousand and one distractions. The late R.C. Sproul put it this way. I think the greatest weakness in the church today is that almost no one believes that God invests his power in the Bible. Everyone is looking for power in a program, in a methodology, in a technique, in anything and everything but that which God has placed in, his word. He alone has the power to change lives for eternity, and that power is focused on the scriptures. And I would add this one last thing, and nothing else. Our delight is to counsel the Word, to preach the Word, to teach how to study the Word, and train how to teach others in the Word. Let's pray. God, your Word is our hope. It shows us every false way in life. Help us, like the psalmist, to hate every false way, and teach us to love what you love and hate what you hate. But as Jesus said, thy word is truth, sanctify us by your truth. It is pure, it is truth. So give us greater hearts to grasp and bolder lips to proclaim and yes, even stiffer backs to stand on the word of God alone. And we entrust the work of the Spirit to your care through this endeavor. In Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.